the agriculture uh, world. Are we ready? Yep, now there. There we go. The Agriculture, Rural Development, Finance, and Policy Committee will come to order. Uh, for the record, uh, quorum is present. Uh, members, uh, we'll start off uh, today with a great honor to uh, have uh, hear from hear from uh, some of our state FFA officers. Uh, it's uh, FFA Day, and uh, we want to uh, acknowledge the great contribution uh, our FFA programs bring across the state and nation and Cole and Anna, I believe, and give them a greeting here from the Ag Committee. So uh, uh, welcome, welcome uh, officers, uh, we appreciate uh, having you here as ambassadors for agriculture and uh, uh, please introduce yourself and uh, what uh, state uh, pos uh, position you hold and uh, where you're from and uh, whatever else you uh, would like to address us with. Uh, welcome, welcome again. Chair Washtrom and members of the committee, first, thank you so much for having us here today. It's been great to meet with some of you over the past two days um, and we hope to continue our relations in the future. My name is Anna Reidenauer, and I'm serving as this year's Minnesota FFA state reporter. And I'm from Dodge Center, Minnesota, so Dodge County down in Southeast Minnesota. And I also have two of my teammates here with me up here and then three others as well. Um, one of them is currently giving greetings in the, in the education committee as well. Um, and FFA, for those who are not as familiar with the organization, is a youth-based leadership and agricultural organization where we provide members with the opportunity to really grow themselves and their potential in their community and in their career pathways. In Minnesota alone, we have 13,000 members and over 35,000 students who are in agriculture education and technical courses. So it's a great opportunity for members, to, and members and students to be able to learn about their potential, learn about their interests, and maybe figure out what they wanna do with the rest of their lives. And so when we're looking at across the state of Minnesota, we find members in every corner. We see them all the way from Thief River Falls, Minnesota, down to Caledonia and from Mankato to Minneapolis. So it's great to see people of all backgrounds, of all interests come together in this organization because we know that come together to do great things for our community. And when we're looking at the future of FFA, we have three different components to uh, the FFA organization and it's FFA itself, work-based learning and supervised agricultural experiences, and then agriculture education in the classroom. And so it's a great opportunity to see what ways members can make the most out of their time in FFA. And as my FFA advisor and agriculture teacher would say, FFA is like a buffet. You can take what you want, leave what you don't want. But if you go to a buffet, you're not going to go for just a couple of bites. You're going to make your money's worth. And so it's great to see students be able to go outside of their comfort zone, explore what is in the future for them, and really make the most out of building connections with others and give, being of service to their community. So it's great being able to see what we can do as an organization to really change the pathway of our future and make a positive impact. Chair Westbrook, members of the committee, I'm Nicole Kozalik and I'm currently serving as the Minnesota State FFA Secretary. I'm from Northfield, Minnesota, which is about an hour south of here. And like Anna said, we all have many different backgrounds that brought us to this organization. And I would like to share with you my background. Um, my parents are both heavily involved in the agricultural industry and we have a family farm. But until I got into FFA, I didn't see myself in agriculture at all. I was actually very passionate about dance. So going to the farm, I just, enjoyed the company with my cousins, with my parents, with my grandparents, um, but really loved dance. And that was my go-to. And I think actually when I was, the year before I joined FFA, I looked at my ag teacher, well, my now ag teacher and FFA advisor, and I said, I don't think I will join FFA. I don't see a place for myself. Despite that, my mom encouraged me to go to the FFA um, first egg class. And from that class, where I got to learn about everything agriculture, just a good bite into forestry and agronomy and animal science, I dove deep into the organization. It, it caught my interest and I really saw that there is a place for everyone in agriculture and that no matter your background, you can find an interest in FFA and in agriculture, which I think is really important as we see a lot of FFA chapters going across the state as well as in the metro area. There's a place for everyone. And as teenagers in a 
weird society right now. We need a place of belonging, and that place is FFA. So really honored to be part of this organization and representing Minnesota FFA this year. Thank you. Chair Westrom, members of the Welcome. committee. My name is Wyatt Halverson. I'm from Thief River Falls, Minnesota in Pennington County, currently serving as the Vice President of the Minnesota FFA Association and the third and final part of the three component model of egg education that I'll be talking about is work-based learning. And we have an acronym in, in that component model that is an SAE, which stands for Supervised Agricultural Experience. Of the 35,000 students um, in AFNR classes, the 13,000 that are in FFA all have an SAE or are all working towards their SAE because the work-based learning is one of the arguably the most important part of the education. It's what hooks them. It's where they can learn real life skills that they need and transferable skills nonetheless about their actual job and really catapult them into the workforce. My story looks a little bit like this. We all know a youngster who says they want to be a veterinarian from the age two, right? I was that youngster in my family. And through FFA, I was able to take classes in the classroom, number one. I was able to explore with all of the contests, the CDEs, the career development events, the leadership development events like public speaking, et cetera. The opportunities are endless. And then with my SAE or my work-based learning, I was able to get a job at our local veterinarian in town and work and, and gain career capital career capital, career capital, excuse me, and uh, a system of, of a network um, for three years. I worked there for three years, and now I am studying animal science in college. So really our goal is to find these students, get them excited about agriculture, and push them through this pipeline and right into the workforce so they can contribute to this wonderful, wonderful system of agriculture, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, or um, uh, systems in in Minnesota, and that's what that's what our goal is. Chair Westrom and members of the committee, go ahead. We thank you for joining us today and allowing us to be able to share the story of FFA. And these are just a few stories, but just like the members across Minnesota, there's opportunity that's endless. And so we're really excited to continue to work with you and advocate for agriculture and advocate for youth and leadership positions because we're really excited to make sure that the future of agriculture and the future of our world is bright. And with that, we'd like to open up for any questions about FFA or agriculture education. Very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Anna, Nicole, and Wyatt. Uh, we can hear your enthusiasm and uh, as ambassadors for agriculture, uh, that, that is uh, very promising. Um, members, uh, was there some questions, Senator? Oh, Senator Murphy, and then Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, it's good to see you all here in committee. Uh, we had a chance to talk uh, as you've been visiting, and I'm wondering if you could share with me and with the committee a little bit of the work that you're doing with your Cultivate series, please. <laughs> So the Cultivate series is something we had talked about um, with the uh, uh, Senate Senator. And the Cultivate series is actually something that Minnesota FFA has been working on after attending national convention back in November. We decided that we wanna take actions towards making sure that our members are ready to be respectful, compassionate, professional, and many other types of characteristics that really create a good leader in our communities. And so with that, we began a, a video series within uh, FFA that was being shared on YouTube, on social media, and it really explains to our members what they can do to really be as inclusive as possible in our organization so everyone can feel like they belong, like Nicole was talking about. And so each month we produce a series of videos based on one characteristic of a good leader. And for that first month, it was about respect. So we talked about what respect was, and we also offered resources about what respect is and what they could do to really improve that skill. Um, so it's a great opportunity for our members to really dig deeper into what they can do to make this organization even better. And we hope to continue that process over the next several months leading up to our state convention in April. Very good, uh, Senator Dames. Uh, well, thank Chair. you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Sorry, Senator Murphy has a follow-up. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Go Chair, ahead, I really Murphy. appreciate sorry. it. Mr. Chair, and, and uh, to our testifiers, uh, when you talked to me about the Cultivate series earlier today, you had talked about it being something available to more than just members of FFA. Is that accurate? Um, Anna, Chair, Nicole? 
Oh, I'll, I'll take it over. Chair Westrom, members of the committee. Yes, it is open to everyone. It is on YouTube, so really anyone can take a look at it, grow with us. We have um, opportunities where students can join us on Zoom as well as people in our communities and in the general public, but it's really trying to just show everyone what is a good way to treat others? And it's something that can be done in FFA, outside of FFA. It's just good characteristics as a human being. Thank you, and Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank, thank you, Senator. Mr. Chair. Just one more thing. I, I wanted to thank you, and it was important for me to raise that question with you today, uh, in part because what I think you are describing and what you're showing is uh, a form of modeling the behavior and the leadership that you hope to see in others and spreading that in using the tools that you have. And you'd mentioned earlier, I think, uh, that this is a weird time. And I would agree, this is a weird time. And I really appreciate the fact that you're using this platform and your leadership yourselves to alter that, to change that narrative for all of us. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being here today. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank the three testifiers for being here today and your fellow members back there that are back in the audience. We really appreciate what you folks do. But I do appreciate the fact that you're willing to take time out of your careers being in college and whatever and spending the time that you are being an FFA, state FFA officer. It's very time consuming. But it is a great opportunity for you to show what your project or what your program is all about. And you folks are great ambassadors for that. We really do appreciate it. We appreciate the fact that you make yourself available at the Capitol and at the House and Senate so that we can ask you questions and learn more about you folks, but also learn more about what your futures are and things like that. And so thank you for that. And I believe we've got a lot of future leaders in this room with the blue jackets on. So uh, I always like to see the group of blue jackets come. It's always, uh, it's a very impressive program. So thank you. Very good, thank you, Senator Dames. Uh, I think you got a softball on that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As a former FFA, I, I didn't expect anything less, so Senator <laughs> Dames. Uh, but Senator Anderson, uh, let let him have your tough question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate appreciate the opportunity to speak to you three and uh, to the rest of the audience that are part of your entourage. Uh, echo what uh, Senator Dames has just said about you and uh, the FFA. Um, I was an FFA member for. Uh, four years in high school and then in going into two years of college. So I, I, I look at how things have changed since uh, back in, we won't go there, <laughs> but um, realize that you have uh, big shoes to fill and you are, as you get closer to that time of graduation from college and moving on into whatever career you've chosen or however the Lord has led you, um, I wonder what your experience is as far as um, the challenges that you face or are going to face in the careers that you might be looking at. I'm, I'm guessing you've got something in mind going, uh, as Anna said, from dancing to farming. Uh, I used to dance when I was raising hogs a lot of times because <laughs> they would keep you on your toes, that's for sure. <laughs> so uh, if you could just explain just a little bit about your challenges. I mean. It seems like it's so far away uh, to that point when you're gonna be jumping off into wherever and, and that special person might come into your life and take you in a different direction. And uh, so I, I'm just kind of interested to see and hear where your thoughts are and, and how you're, someone's already mentioned veterinary, being a veterinary since age two. Uh, will that stay as a veterinarian? I know somebody who's a veterinarian right now and is involved with political on a, a statewide basis, her husband is now running for state office. So it's it's those kind of things that might lead you into a different direction, but still might, you might want to try and keep your feet to the ground and where you want to go. So I'll open it up to all three of you. Uh, who wants to start? Uh, just uh, briefly about uh, maybe challenges you've, you, you foresee in your, your field or uh, your aspirations. Chair Westrom, um, mem members Wyatt. of the committee, thank you. Um, well, we know agriculture is an ever-changing 
industry, one of the biggest, like I was trying to articulate earlier. So issues will be, they're forthcoming, they're here, but the industry is evolving and it's changing. And we have young minds who are in FFA who are developing technology and the industry tenfold um, to be able to feed double population by 2050 per se. So these challenges are here and they're in the back of our minds and we're always thinking about them. You know, with, uh, we have the Agra Science Fair um, where we have students coming up with a multitude of different agricultural science projects and that's going to be actually next weekend we're going to be looking at some of those at the state so uh for for instance yes i do want to be a i do want to be a veterinarian but you know that that could change uh because nobody knows the future right and within ffa like anna was saying about the buffet even i myself have some other interests within <laughs> politics within horticulture etc so um the the opportunities are endless thank you uh wyatt uh What's to go next? Nicole? Um, I would like to add, Chair Westrom, members of the committee. So one issue that I all, I found in 10th grade, I was a prepared public speaker, and I had a topic about the disconnect between farmers and consumers. And this topic, I didn't realize how close it was to my own life. So since, like I said earlier, I was a dancer, very involved in that, but had a really strong roots in agriculture from my family. Um, and once I got into FFA and agriculture, I really started to learn all of the things. And I danced in, in the city, so in Egan, and a lot of my teammates had never stepped foot on a farm. They had no clue how their food got to the table. They just went to the grocery store, picked what was cheapest or what was the healthiest and didn't have that connection. So what I actually started to do was bring members of my dance team, um, friends in my community that had no connection to agriculture out to the farm so they could really see what we did. So they got to ride in the combine with my dad and I, they got to, well, I started showing pigs. So they got to see how how I cared for my pigs and what I was doing with that. With that, But I think since we only have 2% of the population really in agriculture on the farm, um, that is a, definitely an issue going forward is that connection and really sitting at the table with others and communicating our message as farmers. Um, so going into my future, I'm currently studying agricultural communication and marketing and really hope to help bridge that gap in the future. And so FFA is what found what where I found that issue and why I'm so passionate about it going into the future. Anna? Chair Westrom, members of the committee. I'm going to tie together both of their perspectives on these issues, and I'm going to share about why agriculture is so important in our schools, especially. And so looking at what Wyatt said about how agriculture technology is developing within the younger generation and how we can continue to impact other generations and even the future. Um, it's really amazing to see how our members are taking that foot forward and really making sure that they can be the change in our future. And then Nicole talking about that disconnect between people who maybe live in areas that don't have agriculture around them so they don't see the processes or maybe people who just don't have an interest because they've never been introduced. And so when we're looking at the agriculture programs in our schools, we know that some schools have agriculture programs and they're strong, but we also know that there's a long ways to go and that we can get agriculture even more into our schools, um, not only here in the metro area, but across greater Minnesota, maybe looking at northern Minnesota, looking at rural Minnesota in total, um, there's space for us to grow. And so it's really important that we're making that effort towards funding agriculture programs for our schools. So that way then FFA can form and there can be chapters and then we can continue on with that work-based learning. And so I think it's really important that when we're looking at future issues, we're realizing that these can also be solved if we're willing to take the foot forward and help get agriculture in our school systems, because that's what led me to where I am today. If I hadn't been um, in the animal science classes in my classroom, and if I hadn't started my goat and sheep entrepreneurship project within my supervised agricultural experience, I wouldn't know that this is where I want to be today. And so I know that I can take my future into my own hands and know that I'm passionate about what I'm doing and where I'm going. And so that's what FFA has done for me. And I want to make sure amongst um, my other officers, amongst our members, is that we can make sure we can get the most people within agriculture and prepare those who are maybe not looking at agriculture careers, but just making sure that they're well-informed members of society. Very good. Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here today and thank you for being an FFA. Um, I was a city kid. I was not part of FFA, but I did get the opportunity to work on a dairy farm. Uh, so I learned a great deal then. Um, but what, what my question is about, you, you talked about the Cultivate series and the leadership and you mentioned respect. What other topics did you uh, as FFA members choose 
four uh, topics and what you would like to see in characteristics, uh, attributes, or traits in a leader. Um, and do they, I guess, lastly, do, how did you come up with those topics uh, or those traits and characteristics? Uh, who, uh, who would like to answer that? Senate, uh, Chair Westrom and members of the committee. Um, when we're talking about the Cultivate series, we have six different segments. And so each of those segments has a specific trait that we're looking at. And so as I said earlier, is that respect is our first one. And that's one that I was actually able to cover. And so each of us as state officers are actually able to cover one and really go in depth. And so what we do is we talk about what characteristic we want to make sure that our members are really aware of and then talk to people who display those characteristics. And so we're reaching out to people in agricultural positions and leadership positions and members who actually display that within their school systems. And so respect is one of them. Compassion is our next one. I know professionalism is coming up. We have determination. Um, and then we also have two others that I can't think of off the top of my head right now, but I'd be very willing to share that once the committee is over. Um, but those are just a few examples of some of the traits that we're talking about. And I think that some of those traits are some of the most important ones when we're looking at what can we do to really prepare for our future so that way we can be just the most respectful and knowledgeable members of society as possible. Very good. Any follow-up, Senator Goggin? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Any you other very questions, much. members? Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Uh, just you brought up uh, the word respect, and I remember a song from my earlier teen years called R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Some of these characteristics, you could probably make a kind of a music, make it so that you remember those things as you go forward. Uh, big, big thing that I see, I had a desire to stay on the farm, wanted to stay on the farm, but when I asked, my brother and I asked to buy the farm, my dad said, go find a real job. And I thought farming was a real job. Anyway, I just want to know what you and how you would encourage someone who, as uh, Nicole already said, wanted to go into dancing, now she's in farming. Will she stay in farming? And how do you encourage people to want to stay on the farm? I mean, it's, it's a, those kind of things where people who want to be on the farm, and yet because of the economy and the way things are going and the challenges of the future, we don't know, as you've already mentioned, but how, how, what can we do from the state standpoint or from, from society to keep those who want to be on a farm, who want to farm, continue to that tradition to, to be there? What is it that we can do? Uh, Nicole, or who wants to? Chair West from members Why? of the committee. Well, to finish your song, I think you just really have to find out what it means to me. Look at the agriculturalists who are passionate right now and find out what's keeping them there. You know, we wouldn't be here. I appreciate the laughs. Thank you. We wouldn't we wouldn't be here if it didn't mean a lot to us and if we didn't know that these these issues were were at the forefront. Um, we work a lot on teacher recruitment and retention because, like I said, this is this is we're here representing agriculture education uh, and getting students involved. So we're really we're really trying to uh, have teacher retention higher. Like like Anna said, getting a lot more programs started, getting ag ed in the schools because we want to start getting passion into the students because they're the future. And in order to in order to get, make that future strong, that's that's where we need to look to is towards the students and the next generation. Very good, thank you. Uh, Senator French. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you all three very much. Your entire group is one of the most impressive groups of young people that have come through here. And we have about 10 meetings a day and many of us have been here for many years. So I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Why you mentioned Aretha Franklin, you had already mentioned Mankato, uh, your career in politics is already set. And I just wanna say, <laughs> please let us know before you surprise any one of us with an announcement. Uh, I think that would be very much appreciated. And I also wanna say a special congratulations to your adult leadership. Whatever they're doing, uh, they deserve a lot of thanks. And um, I just say to all of you, to be continued. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th dittos, uh, Senator French. And uh, I think I think they might, one of them might live in your district, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, <laughs> I, I, I uh, hear the passion and uh, Senator French's point uh, is echoed. Uh, you guys are great ambassadors for agriculture. Uh, uh, farming uh, reaches long, far be beyond uh, just the field. Uh, 
how, do, how does that food get to the grocery shelf? And uh, as long as uh, everybody needs to eat, uh, we're going to always need agriculture. And so uh, that's that sounds like uh, the message you guys are very passionate about, uh, enthused about, and uh, that's that's a bright future for us. And so I really appreciated meeting with you earlier today and having you join our committee. I think uh, from the comments, uh, our committee is very appreciative of that as well and your leadership and uh, your uh, advisors and the leadership they're bringing to uh, agriculture. So uh, encouraging for agriculture. Sometimes uh, agriculture seems to take a backseat, but uh, we do feed the world. And so uh, keep up the great work. Thank you for joining us and uh, best of uh, luck with your future and uh, careers as you uh, transition into the, uh, to the career that you choose. Thanks again. Um, Members, uh, thank you for your indulgence and uh, your comments. Uh, uh, just these are bright spots of our days, and uh, I uh, think it's very uh, relevant to uh, our ag committee and uh, what we can do to help promote uh, the topic that we uh, oversee here at the legislature and uh, keep a strong agriculture economy in our state, uh, starting with farmers and uh, ending, at, ending at the kitchen table. Next, uh, members, uh, we've got a few bills to do. And, um, you know, I was going to say uh, we've got a pretty full crowd today, and uh, I think we'll just attribute that to the FFA uh, uh, state officers that were here. They drew a pretty big crowd, so uh, maybe the biggest crowd of our committee so far this session. So uh, uh, good, to, good to see a big crowd back, and uh, um, for all of you that join us live, uh, we're, we're glad to have that opportunity here uh, at the Senate and um, our committee. So uh, with that... Uh, uh, we'll call up uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Senate, Chair. Senate File 3585, the chair will move. Uh, Senate File 3585 will be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Civil Law Committee. Uh, Senator Matthews, uh, tell us about your bill, and then there's a couple testifiers. And and uh, we have an A3 amendment, so or A1 amendment. So tell us about your bill and then the amendment uh, briefly, uh, Senator Matthews. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And first off, boy, what a tough act to follow. I appreciate that assignment, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Uh, Senate file 3585, uh, real briefly, and I'll let uh, our testifiers dig into it more, is a Department of Agriculture identified an issue uh, that we wanna make sure uh, does not become a problem, and that's to ensure that any mental health data uh, with farmers that reach out and look for uh, uh, mental health uh, help through the Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline to make sure that that data will be classified as private data and is not subject uh, to a, uh, a public data request or a records request or anything like that. So uh, we believe that statute now currently um, We'll have it correctly classified, but uh, my, my uh, information I've gathered is that there is a questionable interpretation that uh, one could make an argument that the data could be accessible. So the goal of this bill is to make sure uh, that this data would stay private, uh, that there's no question for any alternative interpretation for it, and, uh, and make sure that this can be a, a safe resource uh, that farmers can utilize if they uh, decide to seek uh, mental health resources. So with that, Mr. Chair, um, I could either do the amendment first or go to the testifiers, whichever your preference would be. Uh, this is Senator Matthews, uh, maybe just briefly uh, touch on the amendment. Why don't we move it and get it into the order uh, you wanted as the author. Uh, and, and the chair will move the A3 amendment. Uh, tell us briefly about the amendment change. It's technical. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Or, Chair. Or Senate Council, Ken. Yes, um, it is basically uh, to align with the way that the bill is sitting in the House right now after they have passed it through their committee, and I'd be happy to have uh, Council help explain the specifics uh, uh, that are in it, if possible. Ms. Painter, uh, do you want to just briefly explain the amendment to the members? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, and members. Um, there's just a, a small addition um, adding pass-through recipients to the, the, the text of the bill and also 
Um, another addition is adding an effective date. So it's effective immediately following enactment. Very good. Members, any questions on the A1 amendment? Having none, uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Uh, Senator Matthews, uh, to the uh, bill as amended, uh, your first testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe uh, Ms. Meg Moynihan, who I believe is virtual, uh, is the first testifier from uh, from the Department of Ag. And then we have uh, Chris McNulty, the general counsel from Ag, also available for any questions. Okay. Um, Meg uh, Moynihan, are you with us? Yes, Senator, I am with you here in down in Lesur County on a dairy farm. And I would like to thank you uh, and the rest of the senators on the committee and especially and Senator Matthews for uh, hearing this bill today. I and Meg, if you could just identify yourself for our record, that'd be great. Thank you absolutely. for joining us. Uh, absolutely. Yes, Senator Westrom. Uh, for the record, my name is Meg Moynihan. I serve as Senior Advisor on Policy and um, Strategy and Innovation for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. I have uh, been serving at the department for 20 years, and since about 2017, I have really focused my work on what I think of as the human experience of agriculture, some of the things that Senator Anderson was just getting at, uh, and how, um, how farmers um, are experiencing their lives and the satisfaction of their lives and especially developing efforts and initiatives that support farmers in stress. We know there's a great deal of stress from many different angles that uh, farmers cope with on a daily, weekly, monthly, and seasonal basis. Um, we fund at the department, either directly or via pass-through, several services that support farmers in stress. And those would be, as mentioned in the bill, our Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week by phone, text, and email. And also direct farmer mental health counseling by two practitioners, um, Ted Matthews and Monica McConkie, and that's passed through um, funding from the legislature. Mental health is still uh, an extremely sensitive topic and it is loaded with stigma. And our concern is being able to both assure and ensure privacy for farmers, ranchers, and others in agriculture who are seeking help for their concerns. So we try very hard, uh, and our contractors and pass-through people try very hard to manage uh, and uh, this, this information and not to collect any more personal information than is necessary. Uh, but sometimes we have to collect that, and sometimes it is it is given it is offered to us, and it becomes a record. So although we protect this information with care, we really want to be able to explicitly protect the identity of users as non-public, just in case we or our contractors or the pass-through entities ever receive a public information request for that information. I am joined, as uh, Senator Matthews mentioned, by uh, Chris McNulty. He's deputy counsel for us at the Department of Agriculture, and he is our data practices wizard, so he is available to answer technical questions that you might have about the bill. And I see that Deputy Commissioner Andrea Vobel is also with us today, and if you have any questions at a policy level that you'd like the commissioner's office to address, she would be able to do that as well, and I'm happy to stand for questions, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Monahan. Uh, what a what a opportunity to join us from the dairy farm here in the Agriculture Committee. So, uh, uh, just interesting uh, what technology has allowed us to do, and uh, it came through very well. Um, Senator Matthews, uh, did you uh, indicate Chris wants to testify as well, or or just here for questions? I, oh, sorry, no, I'm Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, my understanding is he's here for questions. Okay. Very good. Members, are questions to the bill, and I'm going to start off. Uh, um, Chris, maybe you can help. Line 1.1 talks about uh, uh, connected to agriculture. Uh, I've got a 
question about how do, how do they decipher or decide uh, what information would be protected and what wouldn't be. Um, if, if you could expand that to us, and I, I am wondering if there's maybe a little more clarification that needs to be done on that, that portion of the bill, uh, because I think the intention is here uh, to make sure people aren't uh, concerned about any discussions they're having uh, with maybe a mental health issue going on and their, their, their point of life becomes public. Um, but uh, Chris, if you could just maybe address that issue uh, or, or Senator Matthews, if, if, if you want to as well, but I'm just, it's a point I'd like to uh, make sure we flush out as good as we can. Uh, thank you, Chair Westrom. Um, the, that language is drafted initially, I believe, to give clarification about the purpose of this law. Uh, that being said, we are open to removing it just to um, clarify that anyone calling for mental or um, mental or behavioral health issues, their identity would be protected. It would not be limited to uh, farmers or uh, members of the agricultural industry. And, and so, uh, my, my understanding and your understanding is the reason is we want to protect the calls that come into this ag hotline primarily. Uh, that's that's the data where we're ultimately getting the uh, person and the people that are that are potentially subject to this questionable area of, of how to protect the data. Um, so so wouldn't it be would it make sense to just open it up to any calls coming in through this hotline are treated as this type of data or any thoughts you'd have? And I, I don't have an amendment for today, but I'm just raising the issue as maybe it moves forward. We should maybe try to. Um, make sure it covers those calls and, and not necessarily the content. Uh, they might be engaged in agriculture, but a lot of people work off the farm nowadays too. It might be, uh, um, you know, situations with their children, with their spouse, with their parents, with neighbors. Um, even though they're involved in agriculture, it might be other issues that are part of the, the, the crisis or the issue going on. Do you understand my point? And, and what do you think, uh, Chris, if you could just give us a response? Uh, thank you, Chair Westrom. Yes, I, I agree. I, I, the purpose of this, um, or I, I believe the intent was uh, in drafting this law was to make it expansive such that anyone calling our, for our services, their identity would be protected. Other questions, members? Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it seems like we could strike connected to farming or agriculture and affect the goal that you're describing um, just as a way of advice. Uh, I, I do want to thank you for bringing this, Senator Matthews. I, I really look forward to the day in Minnesota when we don't think about mental health as a condition attached with stigma. But uh, even if it were not, uh, it is right that someone who seeks uh, help uh, should not have their data disclosed. That is a matter of uh, healthcare and medical practice. And I think this is an important clarification. So I thank you for bringing it. Um, Senator Murphy, I missed the end of your comment. I was uh, talking to staff. Did you have a question or? No, it was really a brilliant comment, Mr. Chair, but oh. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Um, Senator Murphy, uh, thank you. And, and maybe uh, Senator Matthews, uh, Senator Murphy's idea, I uh, was just talking to staff about that, and Mr. McNulty, uh, if we drop that language, do you think that would have any unintended consequences? Um, or I'm thinking it might improve exactly what we're trying to do here, but Senator Matthews. So Mr. Chair, and maybe council can help clarify, I believe that uh, you're considering striking the words connected to farming or agriculture, and the sentence would then read, any individual who seeks assistance with a mental or behavioral health issue through the helpline are private or non-public. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Senator Matthews, I, that, that would be correct. And that, as I've looked at it with staff up here, I think, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, Mr. So, Chair, I would have uh, no objection to that and would be happy to hear uh, MDA's comments to it as well. Uh, Mr. McNulty uh, with, with MDA Council. 
Any thoughts? Thank you, Chair. I, I do not believe we would have any objections to that. Okay. And, and uh, with that, I'll have uh, our Senate Council just say the oral amendment. Uh, members, if you have any questions, then we can talk about it. Otherwise, uh, I'd, uh, Chair, Chair would move that amendment. Uh, Ms. Painter, can you just say what words we would describe, uh, we would sure. be deleting? On line 1.11, delete connected to farming or agriculture. And also I'd recommend amending the title accordingly, the title of the bill. Very good. Uh, the chair would move that oral amendment. Uh, members, any questions? I think it's pretty clear. No further uh, questions. Uh, all those in favor of that oral amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Uh, to the bill as amended, uh, um, Senator Matthews. Uh, members, any other questions? Senator Anderson. Could Ms. Painter uh, clarify the last statement that she made? Was that a, regarding the title of the, the bill? And, and where about what line we were talking about? Um, Ms. Painter? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson. So on line 1.2, uh, to 1.3, you'd be deleting the words connected to farming or agriculture. Very good. Thank you. Other questions, members? Uh, no further discussion. Uh, Senator Matthews, uh, any, um, any final comments? Otherwise, I think we're ready to move to a vote. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll be brief. I appreciate uh, the committee's consideration. I think this is a common sense measure that we should take to ensure uh, this information stays private and uh, appreciate the committee's and, and your support, Mr. Chair. Very good, Senator Matthews. Uh, to uh, the motion members, the passage of 3585. Yep. Uh, uh, Chair renews his motion to uh, pass uh, 35, Senate file 3585 and re-refer it to the Civil Law Committee as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Very good. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Johnson. <laughs> Senate file 3476. Uh, Senator uh, James, you want to move this bill? And uh, motion is to pass Senate file 35, 30, 76, no. 34, 76, uh, and be re referred to the Civil Law Committee. Uh, Senator Johnson, uh, welcome to our committee. Welcome back. Thank you very much. And uh, Senator Dames, you want to make that motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. and. Uh, Members, I move that Senate file 3476 be heard in the committee and passed out and moved to civil law. Very good, uh, Senator Johnson, to that motion. Uh, tell us about your bill and uh, you've got some testifiers. So uh, uh, welcome and uh, uh, tell us about your bill and then is, there's an amendment, an A3 amendment. Uh, that's that's well. correct, Mr. Okay. Chair. Would we, do you wanna move the A3 amendment to get the bill in order? Um, or would you like to do that uh, after? Why don't you uh, briefly tell us what the amendment would do and then we'll move that to get it in the bill, uh, the uh, order the author would like the bill. All right, so the, the, the amendment, the A3 amendment does three things. Uh, it defines a little bit uh, differently the line uh, extension agreement. It also talks about the minimum standards uh, in section two of, um, uh, wait, maybe I'm reading. Well, that's that's the minimum standards, right? Section two. Okay, minimum standards of the download and upload speeds on that, and then uh, really the the last part of that, one point two to one point two five, is just some technical uh, amendments within that. Members, questions the A three amendment. Senator Anderson moves the A three amendment. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion prevails. Senator Johnson to the to your bill as amended. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, this is a, a bill that addresses a need that many of us have heard for years and years and years. Uh, this is one step closer to us maybe not hearing about broadband in the future, um, <laughs> and the needs across the state. 
this is the we've we've done a good job. We've had the Minnesota model for for many years here in Minnesota that's done an excellent job of getting broadband out into most of Minnesota. We still have a significant number of families that are really in need of those services. And you think about uh, what this pandemic has brought about in the last two years, and we see the needs for that uh, internet access across uh, rural Minnesota, but also even within uh, our larger communities. There's still pockets of need within that as well too. Uh, this, this is a significant tool. Uh, broadband is a significant tool for developing um, not only the ability for families to move out there, but also uh, businesses and, and other infrastructure uh, in rural Minnesota that uh, you know we desperately need to keep rural Minnesota and our communities, larger communities, viable. Um, so with that, uh, I will let um, Ms. Boroff talk a little bit about uh, 3476, some of the details behind it uh, and, and what the new grant program uh, would do for our communities. Very good, uh, Ms. Boroff, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, uh, state your name for the record uh, and tell us, tell us about the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <laughs> members of the committee. My name is Anna Boroff and I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Cable Association and my members are proud broadband uh, providers across Minnesota. Senate file 3476 helps ensure that we don't leave Minnesotans behind when it comes to having a strong broadband connection. So we thank Senator Johnson for carrying this bill and we appreciate many of you for being co-authors. So your willingness to think sort of outside of the box to make sure that we uh, fill the remaining connection gaps in our state is really appreciated. Minnesota is about to unleash an unprecedented amount of money uh, for broadband deployment, which is very exciting but the efficient distribution of this massive influx of funding in addition to our own private capital is going to bring some major challenges. So Senate file 3476 will help ensure that this substantial inflow of federal funding uh, brings broadband service to customers as quickly as possible. So the first section of the bill is what we're calling a line extension program. So right now broadband funding programs are not scaled small enough to get grant support to one, two, or maybe even three customers. So without these, this bill, we will continue to leave these customers, these residents and businesses behind. So I'm sure you've run across this situation because I know many of you have talked to me about that. Your constituent looks at a broadband map and because they're so close to infrastructure, it shows them as served sometimes, even when they are not. So unless we provide the Office of Broadband with a tool to identify and reach these households, these locations will continue to wait for service or somehow be forced to come up with the funds to pay a provider to reach them. So the bill creates a tool for homes and businesses who lack broadband uh, to providers and would assist in covering the expense of extending the service to these hard to reach locations. So for example, uh, either yourselves or your constituents can relate to the frustration of having a fiber connection really close, uh, but simply doesn't extend far enough to reach everyone or others have a long driveway and the infrastructure just doesn't you know, extend from that driveway to the residents or the business. So this new program would provide the Office of Broadband a tool and complement existing programs. So it's designed to, to close those remaining gaps. So our goal when we drafted this was to keep it simple and flexible. We recognize that a barrier right now to providers and to the state is we're not equipped to go through a time consuming and prescriptive process for one or two addresses. So Minnesota's excellent border to border program or available federal grants are just not scaled small enough to reach, reach these locations. So this is how the program would work. The Office of Broadband would create a portal on their website to allow any person to report that broadband is not available at their residence or business. The office would then ensure these locations uh, did, does not have service. And then we would rec uh, do a reverse auction on those addresses to allow providers to bid on the cost of extending service. So uh, the provider's bid would include the requested state subsidy the Office of Broadband would select the lowest bid provided as a cost-effective use of state resources. There's also a maximum project cost of $25,000 or a maximum uh, amount from the state for $25,000. <laughs> and all sorts of providers uh, would be allowed to bid. So, you know, it would not just be a cable company, it could be a telephone provider, uh, you know, a co-op, whoever. So the concept uh, we stole, <laughs> we took it from a successful program in Indiana that has and continues to be modeled in other states. The second portion of the bill addresses broadband easements. 
So in 2021, legislation passed allowing electric co-ops who hold an existing private easement for electric service to use those same easements for broadband service. Other broadband providers do not have that same ability, which is the ability to use their existing easements they hold for broadband service. So this bill would give all broadband providers the same easement rights. Um, this change also um, helps with the level playing field for all providers as we try to deploy and it helps the state um, avoid preemption issues created by the 2021 law. So federal law makes it clear that uh, state provisions related to advancing broadband have to be competitively neutral. So we think this is a, a creative approach to addressing our shared goal of bringing broadband across the state. And we really appreciate our partnership with the legislature and with the Office of Broadband. And we're, we're having conversations with other groups to socialize and advance the goals of this bill. And the amendment adopted earlier is a reflection of some of those conversations. So we look forward to working with you all to hopefully pass this legislation to help every household get a strong broadband connection. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I also have our legal counsel as well who helped draft the bill to answer questions as well. So thank you. So, um, Ms. Boroff, uh, is your legal counsel planning to testify or just here for questions? Mr. Mr. Mendoza? Chair, members, he's just here to answer questions okay. that I can't answer. <laughs> so um, thank you, uh, Ms. Boroff. Um, Members, any questions? We'll come back to them. Otherwise, I'd like to get through the three testifiers. Um, uh, Mr. Apitz, why don't you come up and then... Uh, oh, you're on line, Mr. Apitz. Um, well, we'll start okay, with you. Okay. If uh, you can try to cover it in a couple, two, three minutes would be helpful to keep work moving through the agenda. But welcome to our committee. Identify yourself, Mr. Apitz. And, uh, Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John Appitz. I am with the uh, Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, which is the trade association for the 20 railroads that operate here in Minnesota. And I'm here basically both with a confession and an apology. The confession is that I, I am getting a little older and it's probably time for me to get off the playing field because I missed this bill last year. And um, I certainly appreciate the chance to come and uh, explain some of the concerns of our industry uh, this time around because uh, the bill that was passed last year and this one uh, uh, raised some issues for us that I think we can work out if, uh, if we can just spend some time on this. There is currently, I just want to note that there is currently a statute, uh, Minnesota Statutes 237.045, which deal with utility uh, activity on railroad right of way. It lays out a process and the requirements that are involved uh, when you place or use uh, railroad right-of-way for utility purposes. The utilities understand it, the railroads understand it. We've had it in place now for about uh, five or six years, and uh, we spent a lot of hours crafting it and trying to put it together. I think Senator Dames will remember this one as well. We spent a lot of hours late at night trying to uh, work on a few amendments to this. But let me explain why it's important to give consideration to 237.045, and let me paint a real quick picture. Um, railroads involve the use of a lot of heavy machinery moving at a whole variety of different speeds carrying thousands of tons of freight which include things like foodstuffs, car parts, uh, chemicals and hydrous ammonia, sulfuric acid, chlorine, propane, ethanol, a whole load of other stuff and they ride on ribbons of steel which are laid on, uh, laid on, laid on um, ties which are then laid on top of a specific type, specifically engineered roadbed. That roadbed uh, is designed to deal with the weight uh, and the elements that affect uh, the operations of the railroad. So I think you can understand given that situation why maintaining that roadbed and maintaining those tracks is, is so important. It's important to us so that we can maintain our operations but also for the safety of those operations, the safety of the public, and the safety of railroad employees as well. Utility crossings basically undermine those, uh, those roadbeds. And by that I mean literally undermine, go underneath, they mine underneath and lay in, uh, lay in the utilities that are needed. But also if it's not done right, if it's not done properly, can actually undermine the, uh, uh, the stability and the integrity of those, uh, of those operations. If you want to see how these things can go wrong when you're digging underneath railroad tracks, just go talk to the Met Council about what's going on with the Southwest Light Rail right now. You'll get a pretty good idea quite quickly. But let me just say, Minnesota Statute 237.045 has 
addresses the several issues that are involved with this sort of situation when railroads and utilities, when a utility needs to cross the railroad tracks. We have notice and permit requirements. We have engineering standards that are federal engineering standards that must be met to ensure the integrity of those tracks. There's insurance requirements designed to protect the public, designed to protect railroad employees, designed to protect the utilities. There's safety requirements like a flagger. There are flaggers needed when this work is done along railroad tracks. And there's even a dispute resolution process if we can't agree on how best to go about this. The railroads know about this uh, particular statute. We do, and we've worked, we, we, work, we work together to put it together, and it, it works generally speaking. The bill in front of you, 3476, uh, as well as the statute that was passed last year, uh, two, uh, 308A, I think it's 201, provides exception for local governments uh, that have a permitting process in place for when utilities need to lay in new uh, access across their uh, across streets, et cetera. And just looking at that, and given the concerns that we're expressing here, coming to you and saying if we could find a way to cast an exception that uses 237 when you deal with railroad property that would help i think the public the utilities and ourselves as well um, we've discussed these concerns very briefly uh, last night i think it was or the day before with the chair and with the, the proponents of the bill and um, as we go forward i think we can uh, find an agreement on this and work it out i just wanted to make sure though that uh, before I left the field, I didn't miss the opportunity to raise these concerns, so we have a chance to talk about uh, them going forward uh, with the bill. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can certainly stand for any questions anybody might have. Kind of you to have me here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Apitz. Apitz um, there's a Sarah Erickson, uh, Mr. Apitz. Uh, Sarah, are you here or are you online? And I don't know if she was intending to testify also or, or Mr. Chairman, we, you, Mr. Apitz. Mr. Chairman, both Sarah and I were so excited that both of us put our names in and I just handled the testimony. So we're in good shape. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, very good. Just wanted to check. Um, uh, members, uh, I guess that is concludes the testifiers. Is there anybody else here in the audience that wants to testify for or against this bill? Questions, uh, member Senator Dames and then Senator Anderson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Borhoff, uh, when we talked yesterday, I was under the understanding that there was peace in the valley. And it appears that there's not peace in the valley with the railroads. And I served on the railroad commission back in the day, and this is a big issue. And so any ideas of uh, how you think we should resolve this? Is this a bill that needs to be laid over until that issue gets resolved? Do you want to try to, do you agree to do something before the next committee to get it resolved? What's your thoughts on how we're going to handle this? Because this is a, this is an issue when you get involved with the railroads and you start undermining, you do those, those federal regulations and stuff have to be followed when they're not, there are issues. So uh, this was overlooked last year, obviously but it might be the time to correct that for, for both bills so that we don't have issues with that. Thoughts on that? Ms. Boroff? Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, um, I just heard about this issue last night, so this is a new one, uh, and reminding folks that this, this bill did pass uh, for electric co-ops last year, so I sympathize with uh, Mr. Appitz that they missed this last year. Um, those issues should have been raised last year when this, this bill passed. That being said, um, and I do wanna say this language is exactly what the co-ops passed last year. It's extending it to all broadband fighters. I, I hear what you're saying, Senator Dames, and that being said, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking to the railroads and uh, figure out what to do next. So Senator Mr. Dames. Chair, follow up. So you say you're happy to talk with them. Are you, uh, are you saying that you work to get something worked out by the time it goes to the next committee? Ms. Boroff. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, yes, I will I will work with the railroads to figure out what we can do there. Is that okay. work for the author? Thank you. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to Mr. Apitz, uh, what is broadband, how is broadband handled now in regards to railroads uh, as we're putting broadband throughout the state of Minnesota from your vantage point? Mr. Apitz. 
Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, uh, essentially the um, procedures that are laid in place in 237.045 are what is used, and you can go take a peek at that, is what is used uh, for the permit, for the access, and for the other requirements that are in place for placing any sort of utility, broadband or otherwise, uh, across, along, or underneath uh, railroad right of way. And I could detail it if you wish, but that's in place and that's the one we've been using. I think we put it in place in 17, 16, if I'm not mistaken. Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> Mr. Appetz, right now you're not having any difficulty with uh, the issue of uh, installing broadband throughout the state with you, with the railroads? Am I correct in saying that? But you're concerned about the future as far as these line extensions and easements and things like that? Mr. Appetz? Mr. Chairman, Senator Anderson, I, I think that's a very fair statement. I don't think we run into many problems at all. What this does with the with the statute or the bill in front of you and the statute passed last year does from our perspective is basically say wherever there's uh, an, uh, an easement in place, uh, all you have to do is give notice and go forward and, and put in the broadband. And there's a bunch of safety concerns, both from the perspective of the railroad's operations, as well as from the public, uh, 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 the public safety that come to mind when this comes about. So that's why that statute's there. That's why we've come to learn how to use it. I think the utilities know how to use it. Um, that's, we'd like to use that statute for this purpose going forward. No, we don't want to stop broadband. Broadband's important. We rely on broadband as everybody does. We want to get that done. We just want to do it safely and in a way that we all understand how to do it. Mr. Senator, Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Abbott, do you believe that you can wait, work with Ms. Boroff and her uh, agency, agents uh, to get the right language in place to uh, get this thing uh, in place before, say, civil law next week or next two weeks? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Anderson, Ms. Borloff is very competent and capable, as is her counsel, and um, I've got some ideas that we just didn't get pulled together yet today uh, that I think we can work out by the time we get to civil law. Senator Anderson, uh, Mr. Mendoza, I maybe have a question for you. Um, the, the, the issue raised by the railroads, um, and, and Mr. Appitz, maybe let me start with you. Um, sure. If it's wire uh, easements that you already that are already in existence, uh, is that different than uh, if it's uh, wireless towers erected, uh, Mr. Appitz? And, and I guess my question to Mr. Mendoza is, what's their intention? Uh, is it the wire easements? Because uh, I think that was the original intention of the bill that passed last year, but. Uh, Mr. Appetz and then Mr. Mendoza, if you can uh, respond to the question. Mr. Chairman, um, the easements that are in place underneath railroad tracks along railroad right of way are each written specifically to that sort of particular crossing. So a gas line easement would be different from a, uh, a fiber optic easement is different from uh, various different kinds of uh, utilities that run underneath a railroad track. So, um, uh, the answer to the question is, yeah, they're different. You're going to be dealing basically with wire uh, easements, as I understand, in this particular instance. Uh, so casting them may be pretty much similar, but um, different types of utilities have different types of easements crafted for them. Mr. Mendoza, similar question. The, the intention of, of the language and the easements and what it would impact. Uh, if you could address that, is it? Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, Tony Mendoza, uh, outside legal counsel to the uh, Minnesota Cable Communications Association. Um, and as Ms. Boroff pointed out, we, we just learned about this uh, issue uh, last night. Uh, uh, this bill was thoroughly vetted last year, uh, and uh, we do believe this, this issue should have been raised last year. Um, I am happy to have a conversation with counsel for the Railroad Association about their objection, um, but at first blush and just hearing about their objection and substance for the first time sitting here today, um, I question what impact uh, uh, this bill would have on the railroads crossings. What the bill uh, language does and what the co-op language did last year was 
to allow facilities that are already crossing or on uh, the premises to be used for a different purpose. So there's really no additional construction um, or work that really would be done. It's just basically saying if you have an easement for, uh, for providing uh, for a fiber optic line that's already providing phone or video service, that you can uh, uh, use that same easement to provide broadband services. But maybe there's a nuance here that I'm, I'm missing and I'm happy to have a conversation with the railroads about it. But in terms of the impact or the safety impact that this, this bill might have on railroads, I'm missing it right now. Um, but again, happy to, happy to talk more about that with the railroads uh, uh, later. I will say one other thing. Um, Section 237.045, I'm, I'm actually very familiar with that. It has not been a smooth process with the railroads in obtaining uh, crossing rights. In fact, the Public Utilities Commission just opened a new docket uh, based in part on their frustration with the railroads in granting these uh, uh, permits to cross them, um, which is actually a, a live docket right now in front of the commission. They're taking comments that are due on the 21st of March. So if you know, we're willing to work with the railroads, but to the extent that this is some other way to get a hook on utilities in general to extort more uh, conditions or more money uh, for crossings, um, you know, we're gonna have a big problem with that. So I would, uh, love to sit down and hear exactly what the railroads are thinking about this. I don't see the safety impact of this bill, just at first blush hearing the, the railroads objections. And um, it, it hopefully is not uh, uh, another way to, to uh, for, the, for the railroads to, to take another pound of flesh out of utility companies trying to, to you know, build out broadband services to, to Minnesota. Mr. Chairman, could I? Go ahead, Mr. Rapids. If I might, I, I, I just have to respond to that. That, Mr. Chairman, that's not the intent here. Uh, when people come onto railroad property, railroad property is inherently dangerous. And people are gonna be coming onto railroad property to put these facilities in place, whether it's a piece of line, a piece of wire, whatever it might be. They'll be coming onto railroad property with active, in many cases, active trains running. We are not going to be able to take an extra pound of flesh out of anybody or anything else. That all, that's all been resolved long ago in 237.045. What we want to do is make sure when people come onto railroad property that they're safe and they follow the engineering standards and the safety standards that we have in place. We can work Mr. this Chair. out, Mr. Chairman. We'll, we'll be able to work this through. Mr. Chair. Senator Johnson. I, I think uh, this is something maybe we should work out uh, before we get back out in front of uh, the next hearing, wherever that might be. Uh, but clearly there's an opportunity here to do some work on the bill. And I think we could have a, a very uh, good, healthy conversation with the railroads on this. We just want to get broadband out in a safe way to our communities. So, uh, and uh, Mr. Like. Ben, thank you, Senator Johnson. Mr. Mendoza, uh, to the question, um, if you could, I guess, uh, clarify or talk about any, uh, expansion of these easements or use thereof, uh, what your intention is and what you foresee. Um, my, my understanding is it would be wires that are already, that there's already existing easements for, but some have brought up concerns that it would open up uh, the opportunity for 5G or other types of wireless towers. Is that your plan or intention? And uh, how do you see that fitting into this or, or not an issue? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, for the most part, I think the services that are being provided are provided over wire and fiber. Um, it is a competitively neutral bill. Um, and so I think to the extent that um, an existing easement uh, could be used for something like a 5G facility, um, you know, I think we'd have to, uh, to look at that. I think probably right now it would allow that because it is competitively neutral in terms of the technology. The goal here again is to, uh, to allow any provider to, uh, to use those existing easements for facilities that are already in place to provide an additional service. Um, I think practically speaking, whether there are easements that exist out there today that, um, that a 5G provider would be able to essentially, uh, that, a, that a 5G provider already has, I'm not sure that those actually exist, but Again, if there's a, a stakeholder out there that 
is you know, wanting to have a conversation with us about it. We haven't heard about it from anybody yet uh, in terms of concerns about you know, the use of this, stat, this bill for, uh, for 5G services, but if there is a concern out there about it, um, we're certainly happy to talk to, to those uh, stakeholders as well. So, and, and maybe last question on that. So, so is there some concern, and Mr. Appets, you can respond after Mendoza, Mr. Mendoza, but uh, would, would one of the concerns be a, a, a 5G tower being uh, erected different than a current easement may already have contemplated as far as wire or uh, structure to support that, that existing wire, and is, is there a difference? And, and I guess to the railroad's point, is that is that a concern that they would have uh, as well? But Mr. Mendoza and then Mr. Appitz and then Senator Goggin has a question. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I wasn't aware that the 5G issue was a railroad concern until you just uh, spoke. So um, again, I think we will wanna sit down with the railroads and hear or allow them to air all of their concerns. As Senator Johnson just indicated, uh, we're certainly willing to do that but uh, we're kind of hearing these for the first time as we sit down at the hearing table uh, uh, before you today. So I think maybe the best course would be to, uh, to get together with the railroads, hear what their concerns are, um, and then go from there. Very good, Senator Goggin, or Senator, Mr. Raffitz first, and then Senator Goggin. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it's a new issue to me too, uh, I not, thinking about 5G, as a matter of fact, and we'd certainly be happy to have that sort of discussion if it arises. It would be a different kind of act, uh, use of the property. And I guess if you're putting up a tower as opposed to putting up some line, you'd want to make sure the engineering standards were in place to make sure that was safe and done properly. That's not the particular issue that we're raising here. And I apologize again that we didn't raise this last year. Um, that's my fault, and I'll take credit for that. And maybe time for me to leave the field. But in either case, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity just to talk about this. I, th I think we can work this out. This isn't as complicated as it's maybe seeming to appear right now. Senator Goggin, then Senator Murphy. And, thank uh, you, Mr. Members. Chair. Um, Mr. Epitz, if you could uh, give us a brief uh, description of what a typical track bed and easement is, is in size and dimension. Um, so that we have an idea of, you know, for the safety aspect of it is where I'm heading with this is because, you know, you got people walking along the tracks and the trail, uh, and I'm just trying to get an idea of how close a proximity someone would, could be in relation to the trains as they're going by. Okay. Typically the right of way, uh, typical railroad right of way, pardon me, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Goggin, the typical railroad right of way is 50 feet on either side of center. So you're talking essentially about a hundred foot wide path that is the railroad right away. The tracks are four foot six and a half inches, and then you've got the uh, the ties on which the tracks lie, and then you've got the ballast that's underneath that. And the ballast consists of um, um, rough rock, uh, gravel, etc., that's built up to a certain set of engineering standards. So, in answer to your original question, that's what it looks like. That's how it's put in place and that's how it's maintained. The size is about 100 foot, 50, 50 feet off of center on either side. Oh, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so right now with the other utilities uh, having access to the easements and have done work within those easements, are they going, are they doing like directional bore underneath the, the tracks themselves or are they going along this, or along parallel with the track and the easement or combination of both? Mr. Appitz. Mr. Chairman, Senator Goggin, uh, it's a combination of both. The typical, the typical uh, easement or the typical crossing goes underneath the tracks lower than four feet down. So you need to go down four feet, you go underneath the track, and that basically improve, uh, pervert, per, preserves the integrity of that ballast and that other uh, material above it. But there is provision in uh, 40 in 237.04 for the distance that a utility can run alongside or longitudinally, if you will, along a railroad track. It's for no more than a mile, basically, before it crosses over. And Mr. Chair, if I could, just two more questions. 
Go ahead, Senator Goggin. Oh, thank you. Um, so the last question for you, Mr. Appetz. Uh, the safety training is, is kind of is where I'm heading with this one. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of companies have site-specific or uh, company-specific uh, training programs and requirements for uh, contractors that come on, on, their, on their property or on their easements and that. Um, would that be something you would like to work out with the uh, broadband folks to uh, ensure that people who do gain, if, if and when we get this all worked out, that they're going to be able to uh, do their work safely and, and uh, uh, you know, meet all the requirements uh, necessary uh, to get this completed uh, without any, any issues? Mr. Chairman, Senator Doug. <laughs> Um, the answer, basic answer to that is yes. Um, certainly, they have their own training and, and safety procedures that they follow. When you're dealing with a railroad, though, there are issues of, especially if it's an active line of trains coming down the track. Um, in instances where it is an active line, we'll often require a flagger to be positioned so that the train is aware and that the, and that the utility workers are aware of the intersection of those activities going on. We don't want anybody on the tracks when the trains go by is the, is, the, is the short of it. And when you punch a hole underneath the railroad track, you want it to be good and stable and, and good for the utility and good for us. I mean, we don't want the track to cave in on the utility. That produces an effect that they don't want and that we don't want. Uh, last Senator question, Mr. Chair. Uh, this question is for uh, the broadband folks. Uh, what size uh, cable bundles are you typically going to be looking at uh, installing in these easements and right of ways. Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator Johnson. I, I think before, that, that's a good question, uh, Senator Goggin, but I think we're going maybe down the wrong path with this questioning as well. Uh, what last year's co-op bill did was allowed existing equipment that's currently underneath there that's gone through all the processes of, of that easement and allowing uh, the co-ops to use that infrastructure that's already in the ground to be used for for slightly different purposes. So now we're looking at fiber optics that are currently underneath the tracks that can now deliver broadband as well in addition to the other services it provides. So it's not necessarily we're punching holes underneath tracks anymore, uh, but just allowing a larger spectrum of that, that equipment, those lines underneath to be used for this purpose. If there does need to be an opportunity to, to put something new underneath the track, we still have to follow that, that 237 uh, statutory language with all the safety requirements and, and engineering and everything that goes with that and go through that whole process that whether it's cumbersome or not, that's not an issue today, but that's where the safety comes in for that. So I just wanted to be clear as we're working through this, that this doesn't have the same safety, safety impact that uh, might be going through our heads uh, at the moment. So. Do you still want an answer no, for Mr. the bundle Chair, size? This, Senator Goggin. No, I, I think this is something we need to take offline and discuss uh, in more detail outside of committee. Okay. I'm done with my questioning, thank you. Very good, and Mr. Mendoza, to that point, uh, are these easements uh, potentially written so narrow that they would say fiber optic, but they prescribe what can be transmitted? The fiber optic, uh, I think to your comment earlier or not, just so we get a better understanding, then Senator Murphy and then members, we got to move along or hold this over. So um, if you could answer that, uh, Mr. Mendoza, and then Senator Murphy has a question. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that, that is uh, the case sometimes where, you know, an easement could have been granted in the 1970s when a cable system was just providing video and, and it does state the purpose to provide video service. Um, and so just like the co-ops did last year, they have easements that allow them to provide electric service they wanted to update those ex those easements with, as Senator Johnson just said, existing facilities in the ground already just to use it for a different purpose. And that's really what this bill and what the co-op bill did last year. Um, and as Senator Johnson also pointed out, any safety concerns we think would be already addressed in section 237.045, um, where uh, you know utilities, every utility has to go through this process with railroads when they're actually constructing a facility and it sets forth all the safety procedures, et cetera. So again, not quite seeing the need for amending this, this bill, um, uh, but we're happy to have the conversation offline. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I was wondering, Ms. Boroff, if you could uh, take us to the start of this again 
and remind us uh, what the purpose of this proposal is and what's at stake for Minnesotans if we're not able to get it done. Uh, Chair Westrom, Senator Murphy, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. The purpose of this bill is for us to get broadband to as many Minnesotans as possible and not leave anyone behind. And so I was most excited about the line extension program, which we haven't discussed very much, but we're really excited about it. We think it's a way to complement what we're, the work that we're doing already and to make sure that as this federal money comes in and we get these larger swaths of the state covered that we're not leaving anyone behind. And, um, and, and also in that process to make sure the processes we have in place to deploy that broadband are, are as efficient as possible. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baroff and Mr. Chair. Senator Murphy. Thank you, um, Senator Johnson. I um, am grateful that you uh, are gonna take this and uh, work with the, the various parties um, and get this to a place where we can move it forward. Um, I heard you loud and clear on that and it's important. So thank you for that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Johnson. Thanks, testifiers. I mean, I hear safety, I hear insurance, and I hear a desire to have peace in the Valley, and I'm satisfied with what we've been talking about here, that that's what it's gonna take. As a former member of the committee, Senator Johnson, you know how important it is to provide rural broadband to every Minnesotan. Um, but I think once safety's raised, and once there's a question about whether safety is an issue, I encourage it to get worked out and look forward to passing it once it's all worked out. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, any other questions? Uh, at this point, the plan uh, chair's intention would be to uh, pass this on to the Civil Law Committee. I think we've uh, raised some important issues or questions that uh, the parties can work on. Uh, we always have uh, the opportunity to ask for the bill back if we want. I'm not suggesting that's what we would do, uh, but uh, I know uh, Chair Matthews uh, will also uh, be interested in working with Senator Johnson and the parties to uh, look at this. Um, so at this point, uh, we'd, uh, with no further discussion, uh, Senator Johnson, uh, final comment, and then we'll take a vote. Certainly, thank, thank you for the, that opportunity and thank you committee for your patience today as we work through some of these last minute items that are coming up. I'd also uh, like to thank uh, the co-authors, Senator Rosen, friends, Powell and Westrom uh, for your help in getting this across the finish line because I know you've all been integral in getting this uh, moved forward. So appreciate that uh, opportunity. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you. Um, Senator Dames would renew his motion to pass Senate File 3476 as amended uh, and re-refer it to the Civil Law Committee. Uh, members, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion does prevail. Thank you, uh, Senator Johnson, the members. Um, we have a drought relief bill. Uh, we are running short of time. My intention would be, uh, we have Commissioner Peterson here for some brief comments. A couple farmers, I would like to get those testifiers out and this will carry over to Monday's agenda, but let's get started for a, a little while to at least uh, tee up this important issue. So I'm gonna turn the gavel over to uh, Senator Dames. Or Goggin, okay. Senator Westrom, uh, thank you for bringing this uh, Senate file 3479 uh, to the committee here today. Uh, with that, I would like to have uh, Senator Dornink uh, move Senate file 3479 to be heard at the table here. So moved. Uh, Senator Very Westrom, good. to your bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, members, uh, this is a uh, proposal. This bill deals with uh, a uh, drought relief package for our farmers uh, dealing with uh, the damages and the, the lack of rain in s spots across Minnesota last summer and fall, uh, pr primarily last summer uh, with the pastures not uh, getting the, the rain or timely rains to grow, the alfalfa fields and forage uh, crops, uh, silage, 
in some cases uh, not getting the timely rains and the uh, uh, need for uh, some additional aid to help supplement uh, some of those extra expenses that our farmers are going through in the targeted areas. So in the interest of time, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to uh, let Commissioner Peterson uh, tee up the issue as uh, we continue to discuss it and uh, let some of the testifiers that are uh, farmers and that have come in for this uh, testify and then uh, we can continue discussion on this on Monday. Thank you, Senator Westrom. So, uh, Commissioner Peterson, uh, please uh, state your name for the record and uh, give us your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, I'll be brief. Uh, as knowing time is short. Uh, Tom Peterson, Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture. I want to thank Senator Westrom for uh, bringing uh, the bill forward, 3479. This reflects the original uh, version or language that the department had worked on and, and has had uh, in uh, uh, for quite a while or, or that the general concept is $5 million for grants, $5 million for loans for our rural finance authority and our um, disaster uh, recovery loan that we have. Uh, we're, uh, that's a revolving loan account. Uh, and uh, we think now would be a good time to replenish that. We are uh, not out of funds in that account, but we're running uh, somewhat low uh, as we've seen interest in farmers uh, using that account to uh, purchase feed right now. It's a, it's a zero interest loan uh, with a little bit of longer payback. And so I uh, encourage you to look at that. You know, as, as Senator Westrom said, just real quick, if you went back to uh, late August, right before the state fair, 80% of Minnesota was in a severe drought. 50% of Minnesota was in an extreme drought and 10% of Minnesota was in an exceptional drought. Luckily, we got some timely rains, but through the summer, uh, that really brought our corn and wheat, uh, uh, so not, not as much our wheat, but our corn and soybean crop back nice. But the fact of the matter is those, those farmers lost uh, uh, throughout the state. Their first cutting of hay may have been a half. They lost their second, third cutting of hay. And that resulted uh, in just shorter hay stocks. They had to feed hay that they had stored for the winter. Uh, and that reflected in our end of the year uh, hay report in Minnesota that showed our hay stocks were down 35% from last year at, this, at uh, the first of the year. And, uh, and uh, our hay stocks were the uh, third lowest since uh, 1950 or for what we have on. And I see that reflected in auction sales that I go to and discussions that we have with farmers. We've been losing uh, 20 dairy farms a month uh, since uh, uh, really since this drought started in July. We're down to uh, almost 2,000 dairy farms in our state. And uh, the drought isn't the only uh, uh, reason for that, but a lot of the farmers would just say they're simply out of feed and cannot afford $300 a ton uh, feed. And so what we really think in talking with the groups, this is kind of something that we put together uh, in talking with different uh, groups that this would be the best way to do it. We did a dairy relief program a couple of years ago, Senator Western's very active in that. And I will tell you, uh, I had farmers that would literally cry. This bill has uh, up to $10,000 grants. In that case, it was scaled uh, and it was a little different program, but some of those farmers would get a seven, anywhere from 1,500 to $10,000. I had farmers come up to me and thank me uh, for that piece that we worked on and they would literally cry because they said that that helped them pay a bill, maybe their feed bill, maybe something that they needed to take care of right then. And it also showed a commitment from the state that we are behind our livestock farmers. And we also target this too to specialty crop growers uh, as well because specialty crop growers and livestock growers don't have a, a crop insurance that stands behind them. And again, crop insurance does not make those farmers whole, but it's a better safety net than our beef farmers have and, and our uh, livestock and specialty crops. So I just wanna add that in. So, uh, Senator Westrom too had mentioned in the last committee, uh, we had talked about uh, maybe looking at property tax relief. We went with the grant uh, part of this because some of the specialty crop growers, uh, they just don't own uh, their land a lot of times. And so that was where we felt like this was a better angle, something we could get out quick and target it. So with that, I will uh, glad to uh, stand for any questions or we can uh, move on. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, yeah, they, I was very happy that in my part of the state, we got rain, <clears throat> helped our farmers out. But I also had uh, a number of corn farmers that said the deer were eating a lot of their crop. So uh, it wasn't just, uh, it was other factors that were affecting our crop <laughs> yields as well. Um, I think we'll just move on and hold off for questions till we get done with testifiers. Yeah. Uh, if I could have Mr. Dan Glessing come to the table, please.
And Mr. Glessing, if you would state your name for the record and then begin your testimony, please. Absolutely. Uh, Dan Glessing, serve as president of Minnesota Farm Bureau. I'm a dairy farmer from out in Wright County. I hope my kids are mixing uh, TMR right now, actually. But, <laughs> but I represent nearly 30,000 members um, from all across the state. And, uh, you know, for many, the drought is over. But, you know, for the livestock and specialty crop farmers, uh, it's only just beginning the, the long-term effects that it's had. Um, we sent a survey out to our members to see, to see and hear um, some of those uh, the need for it and, and the, the long-term effects that this drought did have. And uh, a lot of those I've included in, in written testimony as well, but some quick stories, you know, hay and forage supplies were starting, the winter supply was starting to be fed um, back in July and August and has run out or is running out. And that's why the, the urgency is now um, for those livestock folks. Other, other um, farmers had to move some of their cattle out of state, some liquidated cattle, but some moved cattle out of state to try and um, prevent themselves from having to sell that lifetime of genetics that they've worked so hard on. Um, and so these grants and, and loans will help to get those cattle back home where they belong. Specialty crop farmers weren't spared either. Um, like was mentioned, they don't have the uh, crop insurance like some of the other commodities do. And, and uh, like was mentioned, those, that insurance doesn't make you whole, but it helps at least hold the banker off another year. But um, the special, specialty crop folks don't have that luxury. Um, and so they wanna be in business for uh, their consumers coming up in the, in the future years, just as much as everybody else, uh, everybody else does. So I'd encourage your support and I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Glessing. Yeah, we'll hold off on questions members until we get through a testimony. If I could, uh, I'm going to go over to uh, the folks that are online now. Uh, Miles Koshel from uh, Cass County. Are you online? I am, Mr. Chair. There you are. If you would uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Miles Koshel. I'm a third generation beef rancher in north central Minnesota, closest to the town of Nimrod. I also serve as the Northeast District Director for Minnesota Farm Bureau. This has been a very difficult year for many farms and ranches, not only across Minnesota, but across the West as extreme drought has continued to drive every decision we make for the upcoming year. As you've heard already, I've spoken with many producers who feel this is the worst drought that they've had to face and are certain that the drought is not over. I know producers who were forced to sell their entire herds when they ran out of pasture and ran out of hay. I know many producers that bought very expensive hay to feed their cattle with the ultimate question that it could bankrupt them but the cost of losing genetics and heritage was more than they could bear. On our ranch, we saw hay production decrease by over two thirds and sold off cattle to try and preserve what little forage we had. When we were unable to bring the amount of hay that we needed to feed our cattle this winter, we were forced to haul half of our cattle out of state to sustain them so we can bring them home, hopefully very soon. Um, my story is like many of the Farm Bureau members I represent and continuing the fear of the drought lasting well into this coming year as many producers facing drastic decisions. Farmers and ranchers don't expect the relief to make them whole, but the relief grants will help the challenge facing producers that is out of our control. And the needed loan programs will help where it's needed most. So again, thank you, Senator Westrom, for bringing this bill forward and look forward to working with the MDA on providing relief for our farmers and ranchers affected by this drought. Thank you, Mr. Kushel. If you want to stay on the line in case anybody has questions for you, we'd appreciate it. Uh, Carol Anderson. Thank you, uh, Chair Westrom and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Carol Anderson. My husband, Steve, and I farm in Benton County, and I serve as Minnesota Farmers Union Executive Committee Chair. On behalf of Minnesota Farmers Union, thank you for the opportunity to share our strong support for action on drought relief. For our farm, this year's historic drought was a tipping point. Um, I met and married my husband um, uh, 33 years ago and we decided to take over my parents' dairy farm. And for every day for 81 years, cows were being milked here every day. We sold our dairy herd because the drought had driven up the price of feed. 
It was going to be time for us to leave dairying soon at our age, but I'm here today because I don't want my neighbors to be forced out. Whether they're another dairy, an orchard, or a cow-calf operation, that's not a loss just for that family, but it's for the entire community in our state. Quick, easy access to relief could be the difference for some specialty crop and livestock operations making it through this year. Now the details of the package, and I'll keep it simple and short. We strongly support the grants and loans in this bill. First, state rapid response grants administered on a non-competitive basis will help livestock farmers purchase feed and specialty crop producers install a new well or purchase inputs for the upcoming season. Although milk prices are better now, and, but so are the input costs with corn over $7 a bushel. The real uncertainty is, as it was mentioned before, will we be in a drought situation again this year? If so, we want to be ready to be of assistance to our farmers. This may not be a silver bullet, but it'll be a meaningful way in getting many producers through to spring. Second, additional funding for the state's rural finance authority will help producers access lower interest loans. I serve on the RFA board and I offered the motion to allow farmers to access emergency loans due to this historic drought last summer. And I can share that there has been more requests for support. Thank you for your opportunity to testify and to Chair Wenstrom from carrying this proposal. I'm happy to stick around for any questions. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Anderson, and uh, glad to hear you can stick around. Uh, Mr. Uh, Edward Eulenkamp. Mr. Chair, thank you very much and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Edward Eulenkamp. I am a, a farm business management instructor uh, stationed out of Staples and Brainerd Campus, CLC. Uh, I have students around uh, mid-Minnesota and up into the northern Arrowhead uh, area. And my farmers that I work with, um, they have went through uh, some hard times here. Uh, first, they had to try to find feed after the drought struck them, and then what kind of feed could they find? Um, most of them, they, they look for the dry feed that they could haul in. And once they couldn't get that because it was too high price, they, they started to go after uh, the wet feed, being uh, corn silage, beet pulp, um, wet cake, anything that could sustain their animals. And so just by the hauling factor of a wet feed, it's, uh, it's more than 50% moisture most of the time. So it just the cost of hauling has is, is created some issues for those students. The other thing that happened here in, the, in Minnesota here too was is the quality of the feed that was uh, harvested was not as good as what we normally would. So uh, additional concentrates uh, needed to be hauled in to sustain these animals too. And also I had uh, students that if they didn't have the feed, couldn't get the feed, they did uh, send their, their cattle out of state which uh, cost of trucking just to truck those cattle um, is, is very expensive because a, a breeding livestock animal, they don't wanna push into the trucks as heavy as a, a what we'll call a, a slaughter of fat cattle. They can handle a little bit more confinement in that, those trucks. So thank you for your time and for uh, looking out for our students and farmers here in the state. Thank you, Mr. Camp and uh, Liz Dwyer. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Mr. Chair Committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Liz Dwyer here with the Land Stewardship Project. I run Dance in the Land Farm in Clearwater, Minnesota. I organically raise a vast variety of market veggies, cut flowers, eggs, pastured lamb, goat, pork, and fiber. And we started the 2021 season to our, be our biggest year yet. We had 100 CSA members. We were vending at five farmers markets, supplying two regional wholesalers with both produce and flowers. And we were supplying two local co-ops, a handful of restaurants, and we had regular customers dropping by the farm to pick up whatever they needed. But by the beginning of July, our well was sucking bubbles and we were unable to keep up with watering. By late July, what crops we had in the ground were withering. By early August, we'd stopped all but two farmers markets and were unable to maintain any of our other accounts. 
By late August, we had to end our CSA eight weeks early because we didn't have enough to give and what little we had, we needed to send to our remaining two markets to try to make a little money. In August as well, we had to send lambs and goats to butcher well before finish weights, months before we normally would because our pasture was just done. By October, we had to stop paying our one employee who understood, but she is uncertain if she will return for after such a hard year with unreliable income, which would be years worth of investment into a highly skilled person lost. By November, my husband took another job to try to help make ends meet, and we started applying for food stamps and county aid to help pay for our daughter's preschool. It was demoralizing because those applications make you feel like a criminal for being poor, and the proof process is exhausting and inefficient. So far, for various issues on the county's end, we've, still, we've had to restart our application three times, and we are still without aid. By December, we drained our personal savings accounts to pay for the most outstanding of our debts, to buy hay and feed for the winter, and to buy seeds and supplies for 2022, most of which we tossed into the air on a credit card, hoping we would catch it when the, with the, when the new year fell with CSA sales. So far, and sales are way down. We lost over $100,000 of revenue in 2021, which is enormous for a tiny farm with razor thin margins. And as demoralizing as all of that is, I felt okay because I knew that we were in the same boat as every farmer around us. But as I have watched dozens of new center pivots go into the big commodity fields near us over the winter, I realized that many of my neighbors thankfully have already been aided by easy access to disaster payments and other resources, but we are not in the same boat. Our farm feeds thousands of families in our community, and yet, because of last year, we can't even afford to fix our insufficient well, let alone approach recovery, because there is no meaningful aid for specialty growers like me. Our story is harsh, and I know we are not the only ones feeling it. Many farmers are still struggling from this past season. The need is great, and I am appreciative that this rapid relief grant would be non-competitive, and I ask that you do support payments of $10,000 per application. It is honestly a drop in the bucket of our need, but we who feed our communities, who guard and protect soil and water, and the possibility of a future for all of our descendants are desperate. This is exactly how a food system breaks. While these funds will not make up for all the costs this season incurred, these grants and loan payments will help keep more farmers on the land, stewarding our soils, feeding our communities, and I hope that you will support us. Thank you for hearing my story, and I will be available to answer questions. Thank you, Mrs. Dwyer. And, uh... Um, keep your head up and uh, know that we uh, are going to be here doing everything we can to, to help our farming communities out. Um, Mr. Clavin, if you would uh, state your name for the record and uh, proceed with the testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Bruce Clavin, I represent the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association. We had a lot of members affected by this drought. My testimony is simple. We wanted to go on the record supporting the bill. Thanks, Senator Weston, for carrying it, and also Commissioner Peterson for all the time he spent going up to meetings and putting this together in the administration. So we simply uh, support the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cleveland. And at this point, I'll open it up to any members for uh, questions. Uh, Senator Dorning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all the testifiers. Um, just really appreciate all your hard work. I grew up on a dairy farm. I, I know how hard it is to work every day and the struggle you must be feeling and it's experiencing uh, is just, definitely heartbreaking to me too and um so but the question i have is uh to maybe commissioner peterson so in the in the bill it talks preference may be given to pro producers located in counties that include uh d4 so how many counties are we talking in, in the d4 area commissioner peterson uh Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Dornick, um, I'd, I don't have it exactly. We could share the map with you. Uh, we could do that after the committee. We'll send out the, the map we were looking at is uh, right before August. Um, or, uh, and uh, uh, it would be about uh, five or six counties up in mostly in Senator Johnson's district and Senator Atke's district. It was kind of a swath just to the east of Senator Eakin's district that uh, really got hit hard uh, by this uh, by the drought. Senator Dornick, follow up. Mr. Chair, yes, uh, Commissioner Peterson, just probably another one I'd like to hear, you probably can't get the numbers, but kind of how many farmers are we talking about? Uh, that'd be nice to know that too. Uh, Commissioner Peterson. Uh, um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Dornick, um, you know, kind of interesting on this bill, a couple other things I just wanted to say in um, this, this bill is uh, Bill Sen uh, Representative uh, Sundin and 
has taken and Senator Westrom, uh, we have a larger bill too, I just wanted to mention from the department uh, that also includes a DNR package in it. But this bill um, in particular, these grants too, I always said that this is scalable. This is what we put out there. We put out $5 million. Um, you know, if you wanted to go uh, 3 million or 10 million or whatever you want to do, the more money we have, the more farmers we're gonna help. If you could, uh, Ms. Dwyer talked about the $10,000 grants, you could do, 5,000, originally one time we drafted this bill or ideas with ideas from the group. Uh, I had it at 5,000, our staff moved it up to 10 after talking with people. So you could scale this and then it's gonna help as many farmers. But if you think about, you know, I said we have 2,000 dairy farmers in the state. We have 3,000 fruit and vegetable farmers. We have, you know, uh, maybe as many as uh, 20,000 total cattle producers in the state. That could include somebody like me who has three goats. Um, you know, too, and, and we're, you know, trying to target it as much as we can. So it, it's hard to say, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of number of what would be available. And then again, trying to target it to people, you know, 80%, uh, but they would have to do a narrative and everything too. Um, the, the house did a thing too, where we would target a uh, million dollars of the, of the 5 million that's appropriated we would do the first million to specialty crops and the first million to uh, um, livestock. They also uh, carved out 500,000 for people that sell at farmer's markets in their uh, marked up version of this bill that uh, is on the floor. Um, so, and then after they had that, that 2.5 million left, we would uh, randomize uh, the, the rest that was left over. My intention kind of was we could see after we did that first million, on each if there was you know, 5 million for live, livestock and requests and only a million in specialty crops or vice versa, then we would know what we could target. So um, I don't know if that helps or not, but that's kind of what we're thinking. Follow up, Senator Gornick? No, Mr. Chair, I just wanna thank you for your work, uh, Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chair. Any other questions from the members here? Uh, I'll turn it over to Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, I know we're all uh, competing for other meetings or obligations we have. So uh, my intention uh, would be to bring this back up Monday and give us uh, more due time. Um, we had lots of good discussion today and uh, we try to fill up our uh, agenda, but it's always a little hard to forecast and prognosticate exactly uh, how long things are gonna take. So uh, we do not wanna short this. Uh, I wanna thank all the testifiers that could join us here or online. And uh, they're certainly welcome to join us back Monday, but I also wanted to hear from them so we didn't uh, inconvenience them uh, because they've got important work to do on their farms. And so uh, it's good for us to hear them and we can finish this discussion Monday would be my recommendation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Senator Westrom. So with that, we will table this bill and I do wanna thank all of our testifiers for uh, your patience and, and uh, for your testimony. It was uh, what we needed to hear. And with that, we will uh, table the bill. And with no further business in front of us, we will adjourn the meeting today. Thank you.